Welcome to Single Malt History with Gareth Russell, pouring out your serving of pure, distilled, intoxicating, and occasionally delicious history. Welcome back to Single Malt History with me, Gareth Russell, and I'd like to start with three thanks for this episode on the Queen Mother's cousin and the sinking of Canada's Titanic. Firstly, to Mike Poirier for his generosity in access to his extraordinary archive regarding Edwardian ocean liners and high society. Secondly, to the staff at the Linen Hall Library Belfast for their kindness in allowing me to access documents pertaining to the Empress of Ireland disaster in 1914. And finally, to Peter Engbor Clastrum for his research on the Empress of Ireland's passengers. This story was initially intended to feature in Do Let's Have Another Drink, my biography of Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother, out now, shameless plug, in hardback and audio, and coming this May, that's May 2023, in paperback to the United States and Canada, and in paperback in October for the UK, Australian, Canadian, excuse me, not Canadian, Kiwi and Irish markets. However, I felt it might be better as a podcast episode, not just because it took the focus a little too much and for too long from Elizabeth, the subject of Do Let's Have Another Drink, but also because a podcast episode would give me the chance to tell this episode from Charles Boselion's life in detail and depth for you here on Single Malt History. And that story begins on the afternoon of Thursday, 28th May 1914, on the docks of Quebec City, the Quebecois and Eastern Canadian port city, where 28-year-old, tall, athletic, dark-haired and good-looking, Charles Lindsay Claude Boselion presented his ticket as he walked up the gangplank and onto the 14,000-tonne Empress of Ireland, a passenger liner due to depart soon for Liverpool, England. Charles was joined by his 25-year-old friend and colleague, John Abercrombie, who was travelling on the same route home as Charles. On the dock behind them, only a few feet from the ship, passengers and luggage streamed from a special regular train that brought paying customers to the Empress of Ireland on sailing days. The red and white flag of her owners, the Canadian Pacific, fluttered in the breeze. All the company ships were empresses. The Empress of Ireland's sister ship and running mate on the Quebec to Liverpool route was the Empress of Britain. The Empress of Ireland had initially been due to be christened the Empress of Austria, until in a fit of patriotic zeal, the company decided that going forward, new ships would only be named after areas of Britain, its empire or the dominions. Charles Bowes Lyon and John Abercrombie presented their tickets to a steward and were led through the corridors of the Empress of Ireland to their cabin. Travelling in first class, they walked down sweeping wooden staircases and through passageways in sombre good taste. Many first class cabins offered two single beds, and like modern hotel stays, friends often booked a cabin together to keep costs down. We assume Charles and John shared a cabin on the Empress of Ireland, but it's not clear if they did. They may have booked single berth cabins rather than a twin room, for want of a better word. They likely shared a cabin, or perhaps were in a cabin next to one another, as they're referenced as travelling together. But it doesn't make much difference to the story whether they did or did not. The Empress of Ireland and her sister, the Empress of Britain, were among the fastest and largest ships to carry passengers from Canada to Britain. Certainly, they were the most comfortable on that route. But it was comfort that was key and king rather than luxury. Unlike the larger ships operating the route between Europe and the United States, where that month the Germans had introduced the world's largest moving object, the luxury liner Vaterland, which weighed in as nearly three times heavier than the Empress of Ireland. Due to sail for New York a few days after the Empress of Ireland reached Liverpool was a new British luxury liner, the Aquitania, soon to gain the nickname The Ship Beautiful for the palatial elegance of her accommodation. <laughs> 
but such ostentation belonged to the New York run. Those embarking in Quebec did not expect access to a swimming pool inspired by the ruins of Pompeii, like the one available on the New York run on board the Imperator. They would not travel at the speeds of the Mauritania, nor would they eat in dining saloons inspired by Tudor palaces, as passengers did on board the Olympic. Instead, passengers on the Empress of Ireland could expect the solid and the reliable, the comfortable and the consistent. A passenger on a previous trip had written, The ship is very comfy and the food is good, and I have done nothing but eat non-stop since we left. Four years before Charles Bowes Lyon stepped on board, a British aristocrat called Liddy Briggs had booked herself into second class, travelling on board the Empress of Ireland under a false name to see if the treatment in second class was suitable and safe for young unmarried British women hoping to emigrate to Canada. Also a successful author and campaigner for women's rights, Lady Briggs managed to blag her way into third class too for a tour to see what it was like for prospective emigrants. Luckily for the Canadian Pacific Line, Lady Briggs informed the organisations she worked with in England and Canada that she had been highly pleased with her experience. Much to the company's relief, who only found out about this little fact-finding mission after Lady Briggs had disembarked in Canada. A big selling point was that their ships were also reliable when it came to their timekeeping and their onward connections. The Canadian Pacific also operated a vast network of railways, as well as sailings from Western Canada, meaning that a single booking could take a passenger from a train station in London to the Russian port of Vladivostok, if they wanted, with stopovers in Quebec, British Columbia and Tokyo. The ship's timetables meant that the Empress of Britain left Liverpool as the Empress of Ireland left Canada, and vice versa, running a commercially successful shuttle across the North Atlantic, which, as the company literature informed potential customers, consisted of two days on the St. Lawrence, less than four days at sea. Charles Bowes Lyon's six days journey began at 4.27pm as smoke poured from the Empress of Ireland's two funnels while her propellers churned the water around her and she eased, confidently and unostentatiously, away from her pier. On deck, a band of Salvation Army members travelling in second class to a conference in England played O Canada and then appropriately for a Canadian ship that had been built in Scotland Auld Lang Syne. As whistles blared for departure, their music shifted to the Christian hymn, God be with you till we meet again. The weather was beautiful and fine, a Canadian early summer afternoon, as the Empress of Ireland, carrying nearly 1,500 people, began her journey up the St. Lawrence River. Happily for Charles Bowes Lyon, first-class passengers had access to several deck spaces to watch the St. Lawrence scenery pass by, including a covered promenade deck, which was frequently used for passenger cricket matches on the long journey across the Atlantic. All the Bowes Lyons were cricket mad. Charles's uncle, Lord Strathmore, liked to keep himself in shape and in practice out of season by bowling Christmas puddings down the dining room table to his wife. During his school days at Eton, Charles, like his cousins and fellow pupils, played for the school teams, and he'd kept up his love for the game during his subsequent pursuit of an engineering degree at Durham University, and then during his years working as an engineer in India, where in 1912 he had met and befriended John Abercrombie. The two of them had been in Canada for the wedding of another colleague and friend, Alistair Forbes, at which Charles had been best man and John an usher. From the wedding, the friends left Vancouver on one of the Canadian Pacific trains and made for the Empress of Ireland, and through her, home. Charles had not been home to Britain for a couple of years. John hadn't been back for four since he left for a job in 1910, first in India, then in Myanmar, known then as Burma, and finally in Hong Kong. Afternoon tea, a touch late, could have been served in the very popular first-class cafe as the voyage got underway, 
There was also a mahogany panelled library with 650 books, as well as a music room, but it would be dinner at 7 o'clock that evening before Charles got a proper look at the rest of his fellow passengers. As he and John wandered into the dining saloon, it became clear to them that this was not a busy crossing. Charles was one of only 87 passengers travelling in first class on this voyage, about a quarter of the ship's capacity. Among his fellow travellers tucking in to the first night dinner was the British playwright Lawrence Irving and Sir Henry Seton Carr, former Conservative Member of Parliament for St Helens, Lancashire, who was returning to England after a long hunting trip in British Columbia. In terms of aristocratic connections, Charles Bowes Lyon was probably the best socially situated of the Empress of Ireland's passengers. Both of his grandfathers had been earls, heads of two of the oldest and most prestigious families in the Scottish aristocracy. His father, Francis, was the second son of the Earl of Strathmore and Kinghorn, while his mother had been born Lady Anne Lindsay, a daughter of the Earl of Crawford. The Lyons, as they had been then, and the Crawfords had both been members of the Scottish nobility since the 14th century. The Crawford earldom was granted to the Lindsay family by King Robert II in the 1390s, and the Lyons had been masters of the famous Castle of Glams from about the same time and they were given an earldom by King James VI and then another one by Charles II in the 17th century. Charles's uncle Claude had succeeded to the earldom in 1904, and his youngest daughter, Lady Elizabeth Bowes-Lyon, was 13 years old by the time her cousin boarded the Empress of Ireland and two decades away from becoming Britain's Queen Consort, as much to her surprise as everybody else's. Although he was probably the highest ranking passenger on this voyage, or at least the best connected in terms of family, Charles Bowes Lyon was not the most socially prestigious passenger ever to travel on the Empress of Ireland. In her eight years of service on the seas, the Empress of Ireland had thus far carried British, German and Japanese royalty. In 1907, a passenger in first class had been His Imperial Highness Prince Fushimi Sudnaru, a field marshal in the Imperial Army, returning from a state visit to Britain via Canada. In 1911, the ship carried King George V's uncle, Prince Arthur, Duke of Connaught, to Canada to take up the office of Governor-General. Prince Arthur travelled with his wife, the German princess Louise Margaret, who described life on board the Empress of Ireland as most comfortable. Any day spent travelling, I think, or starting a long journey can be an exhausting one, and after dinner Charles and John, like most of the passengers, retired to bed as the Empress of Ireland moved through patches of fog that rolled past their portals. They felt the ship stop for a few minutes to allow the harbour pilot to disembark as usual into a small tugboat that stopped alongside the ship, which took the pilot the one and a half miles to shore. As Charles and John dozed off, they may have heard the eerie sound of the Empress of Ireland's fog whistle ringing through the darkness. Just after two o'clock in the morning, they were flung from their beds as the entire ship shook and shuddered when a 6,000-ton Norwegian collier, the Storstadt, rammed into the Empress of Ireland's side. Debate would continue on and off for decades about which captain, if either, was to blame for the collision between the coal-transporting Norwegian ship and the Canadian passenger liner. But as Charles and John scrambled to their feet, they may have heard the panicked cries of the Empress's British captain, Henry Kendall, ordering the Norwegian ship not to pull back, to instead keep its bow rammed into the hole it had created when it hit the Empress of Ireland. According to some sources, that was impossible, because there hadn't been time to cut the Empress's engines, so she moved forward and disengaged herself from the prow of the Storstadt. Others claimed, in a panic, that the Storstadt's crew, headed by Captain Anderson, reversed, to deliberately pull their ship away from the Empress to check on their own safety first. Whatever the truth was, the Storstadt lurched away and separated from the enormous hole she had created 
when she accidentally rammed in fog into the Empress of Ireland. As soon as the Storstadt pulled back, 60,000 gallons of freezing water per second began pouring into the Empress of Ireland. Those asleep in their cabins at the point of impact had been killed instantly or wounded so badly that they drowned where they had been trapped. Those in the cabins near the point of impact were drowned as the St Lawrence River water began pouring into the corridors with a thundering roar. As Charles and John scrambled in their cabin to get something warm to wear, the Empress of Ireland began to keel over. Within minutes, the ship was at such an angle that half her lifeboats couldn't be lowered. Only a few got away, another tipped over mid-descent, hurling screaming passengers and crew into the river below, or slamming them against the metal hull of the sinking ship. Up on deck, a travelling Protestant clergyman watched in horror as children still in their pyjamas, were running about, screaming for their parents or for help. He saw parents try to grab their children before, together or separately, they slipped off the tilting deck into the St Lawrence. Captain Kendall's cries through the megaphone trying to give orders over the panic for the lifeboats were valiant but useless. Many passengers and crew were still trying to race their way through the tilting corridors to get up on deck when the ship's lights failed with the rest of her electricity about five minutes after the impact. Plunged into darkness below decks, none of them stood a chance unless they managed to join the hundreds scrambling out of their portholes to try to get onto the side of the ship as it rolled over. By this point, the Empress of Ireland was almost horizontal on her side, presenting the surreal sight of passengers walking along the hull. One passenger even stopped to tie his boots, his boot laces, excuse me, as he went. Fourteen minutes after the Storstadt had slammed into her, the Empress of Ireland sank beneath the surface. The ship that had caused the damage began to lower lifeboats to help those screaming in the water, but the chaos of the sinking itself had already claimed so many lives. Many passengers were injured or killed when they were caught in the Empress's suction or slammed into the debris spilling out of the sinking liner. About one in five of those who had boarded the Empress of Ireland the previous afternoon were alive by sunrise. Third-class passenger Henrietta Brooks, called Hetty in the family, had survived, but had felt her toddler daughter Dolly being sucked frantically from her arms by the current after they both fell overboard. Hetty then found out that her friend Louisa Felstead, who had been asleep in a cabin near hers, had drowned, as had her husband and their two children, 14-year-old George and 8-year-old Edith. On the rescue ships, which included two smaller ships that had arrived on hearing the Empress of Ireland's distress calls, husbands burst into tears at seeing wives they thought had drowned, only to discover that their child or children had not made it. Another survivor included a 43-year-old Irish crew member, shivering but alive, called William Clark, who had survived the sinking of the Titanic two years earlier, where he'd also worked below decks. Comparisons between the Titanic and the Empress of Ireland were made almost immediately, earning the Empress the sometime nickname Canada's Titanic. However, where the incredulous cry for the Titanic in 1912 had been to ask how had so many people died that night, with the Empress of Ireland in 1914, the question was how had so many, indeed anyone, managed to survive? To the Titanic's two hours and 40 minutes, the Empress of Ireland had under a quarter of an hour. As an American newspaper noted forlornly, they did not even have time to pray. It was so quick, on a foggy, cold night, that it was a wonder that 465 people had survived, while 1,012 perished. Charles Boslyan and John Abercrombie had, like so many others, been saved by their physical strength. 
their fitness, and above all, by their familiarity with and ability to swim. And this was a theme that survivors returned to many times, that only the strong, or those who could swim, stood a real chance of survival that night. Survivors like the 17-year-old first-class passenger Tyria Townsend, who had been on an around-the-world tour with her aunt, who could not swim and had drowned, whereas Tyria, who had learned to swim growing up in New Zealand, lived. The same love for swimming had saved the life of second-class British passenger Emily Court. But of the 1,012 victims of the Empress of Ireland disaster, the overwhelming majority had been the vulnerable, the physically weaker, or those who did not know how to swim. Of the 138 children on board, four survived. 41 female passengers survived, 269 drowned, 172 male passengers lived, 437 did not. Strength and swimming were the deciding factors for those who had either survived the initial collision and then managed to make it up on deck. As one journalist writing in 1914 concluded, thus, the story of the most terrible disaster in the history of Canadian navigation is written more grimly, more vividly in hard figures than it could ever be in words. Brought on board the Storstadt, Charles Boslian and John Abercrombie were taken down into the boiler rooms and engine rooms with other survivors in a desperate attempt to warm them up. Charles and John said later that what they saw in those rooms below deck were the closest things to the open gates of hell that they could possibly imagine. John recalled, When we got on board the Storstadt, everyone was rushed into the engine room. Edwardian concepts of privacy and decency were abandoned as both genders were shepherded below in various states of undress. One second-class passenger, a gentleman who, like many then and now, preferred to sleep without pyjamas, felt embarrassed to be standing there, quote, naked as the day I was born. Others who had managed to escape the Empress of Ireland with some clothes on had to take them off to dry them before hypothermia claimed what the river could not. John Abercrombie continued with his memory that men and women literally stood naked about the cylinder heads and fire doors in an effort to get their clothes dried and their bodies warmed. Some of them couldn't stand, they were so weak. Those who couldn't stand were generally held up by fellow survivors, but then, to Charles and John's horror, they spotted a quasi-conscious fellow survivor twitching and half-screaming, full of agony but not volume from that sort of horrible place between the conscious and unconscious. The two strong Norwegian crew members trying to help this man had pinned the naked gentleman up against the hot cylinder head. The strong crewmen helping were trying to revive him, that was their main focus. But John and Charles realised that the unconscious survivor was in agony. They began shouting to the crew members to stop, to let him go, to put him down. But the language barrier prevented them from being understood for a few seconds. And John recalled with palpable horror, they knew only that they were trying to revive him and paid no attention to his piteous struggles to get away from the steam hot steel. Finally, according to John, the crewmen understood and took the survivor away from the cylinder head. At which point Charles and John saw that a large section of the survivor's flesh had been, or skin, sorry, had been burned off the gentleman's back. He had not only been brought back to consciousness, John wrote later, but to terrible suffering. Then Charles and then John worked their way through fellow survivors performing CPR and what they called artificial breathing. Several times while doing this, Charles Boslian realised the person he'd been working on trying to save had already been dead by the time he started. The scenes they had survived and witnessed that night were, as they said, 
less the stuff of nightmares and more of Dante's Inferno. Taken back to a Canadian port to be treated, Charles, John and their fellow 463 survivors tried to make sense of how so much horror had been inflicted upon them in less than 15 minutes. From Canada, Charles returned home to Britain, where his survival was toasted by his relatives. The media's interest in the Empress of Ireland disaster did not last long. Within a few weeks, its sinking had been pushed off even the inside papers, excuse me, inside pages of a newspaper by the story of the assassination of the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand by a nationalist gunman in Sarajevo. That murder, of course, helped lead to the start of the First World War that summer. Charles Boslyan volunteered as a soldier and enlisted in the Black Watch Regiment with several of his cousins. Ten weeks into the war, and five weeks after his 29th birthday, Charles Boslyan was killed in battle on the Western Front. It had been five months since he escaped the Empress of Ireland. His friend, John Abercrombie, later went back to work in India, married, was knighted by King George V and died in 1960. The wreck of the Empress of Ireland is a protected site by the Canadian government and lies still on her side at the bottom of the St Lawrence. Thank you very much for joining me on this episode of Single Malt History. Please join me um, for our next episode, the story of the dashing nobleman nicknamed Silken Thomas and how he defied Henry VIII. I've been Gareth Russell. Thank you and take care. (laughs) 